Hi there. There's not going to be too much in the way of agricultural language today, seen as we're joined by a very polite young South African, but the odd word might slip out. So just be mindful of that one. Enjoy. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to another Gas It Out podcast. Uh, we are going uh, stratospheric uh, over recent weeks. I mean that in terms of the guests, obviously not in terms of people listening. Uh, but Guy Martin, Susie Perry, John McGuinness and now a MotoGP rider coming up. And we will hopefully have a couple more coming up soon. My name is Gavin Emmett and on the other end of the line, hopefully, is Neil Hodgson tucked away in his hidey hole hibernation somewhere. How are you, Neil? All good. Gav, this feels a little bit rushed. Normally we're a little bit more organised. Yeah. This has this has been in the what's what's it taken in the planning? Two minutes? Yeah. Three? Ex- explain what happened. Basically, I said, shall we get Brad Binder? Now, both me and Gav get on really well with Brad Binder, ex Moto three world champion, finished second in the Moto Two Championship last year, is gonna is is riding for the factory KTM team in MotoGP this year. So Gav got in touch with KTM's press people. As per usual, the press people didn't get back in touch with Gav, or they did, but nothing really happened. And I said, oh, I know someone who knows him really well, Lance Isaacs, who's a really good friend of mine. You might remember Lance Isaacs. He was uh, World Superbikes and World Super Sport mm, back yeah. in the early early 2000s. So um, anyway, so I messaged Lance and said, is there any chance you can ask Brad Binder to come on our podcast? Bear in mind, Lance listens to this podcast. So yeah, I've seen, I've seen him comment and say he yeah. thought it was all right, which was... Yeah, which I'll is bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, if you ever go to Cape Town, Lance Isaacs is the, is the ultimate tour guide. He knows all the cool places to go. But anyway, oh, that's that, another that, story. Do you know what that says to me straight away? That says to me... He likes a drink. Hod, no, no. What it says to me is uh, Hodgie is absolutely taking him liberties yeah. <laughs> when he's been on holidays in Africa. That's uh, what honest... it says to me. I bet, it, I bet you have, haven't you? Yeah, him and his uh, beautiful girlfriend, Liesl, we, we, me and Vic, my girlfriend, we, we had so many... Because I was in South Africa in Cape Town in January. God, it seemed like a long time ago, but anyway, yeah. we, had, we had such a good time. So anyway, I got onto Lance. Lance went, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll ask him. So Lance came straight back and said, yeah, no problem, he's well up for it. Here's his number. So I text Brad, oh, thanks for agreeing to do it. Uh, can you do it tomorrow morning? No, no reply. Bear in mind, then I went to bed last night and I thought, oh, well, he's, he's obviously not that interested. Anyway. Typical rider, typical rider. So, so Typical rider. So I had a moan at you until last night going, well, I haven't heard anything. No, oh, bloody riders. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so then I thought, well, I'll just mes- me- message him again this morning going, hey, mate, you, did you check my message? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Like, basically, half nine. <laughs> So, so I called Gav. Gav, obviously you were still in bed, weren't you? Um, I, was I, like... wasn't, I wasn't. To be fair, I wasn't. But uh, the computer was uh, downstairs and it had crashed. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, this is what we're dealing with here. It's not high-tech equipment or anything like that. My uh, so anyway, it, it, laptop. It was a last-minute rush, wasn't it, basically? Bit, bit but last anyway, minute, we, bit rushed. He knows, he knows we're going to call him. We're going to call him in a few minutes and uh, be... I was just actually thinking, though, he's going to be our first MotoGP rider we've spoken to on the podcast, but... Mm. Is he a MotoGP rider? Well, that is one thing, and I was... It, it, he hasn't, was he hasn't about, done a race yet. You know what I mean? It's quite funny, really. But he has tested all the way through. But but it's actually more of a story. I was speaking to someone the other day about, uh, you know, we want, we're want we going to get some MotoGP riders. Well, obviously, we work in the paddock. It's going to be a lot easier when we're on site. A few people have been asking, will you continue the podcast? Yeah, we, we wanted to do this anyway. Uh, but you, you try fitting it in between these opening races of the year when you're... You know, you're away for nine days at a time, including flying and going away and everything, and then finding time when you're back. And uh, Neil has to travel around with other work and go and see his kids, that sort of thing. We just, it's really hard, isn't it, to try and even find an hour yeah. to do it. So, this is, it gave us the excuse, didn't it? Um, yeah. yeah. To, to, to be able to do it, to be able to get it in. So, we thought, look, we can get most GP riders pretty much, not any time. That's, that's not sounding like an idiot to say that. But we we be able but to get can. most yeah. But we thought we why not get a lot of the other motorcycle personalities that you know from around before we get back to bread and butter. Anyway, for me the big story at the moment, or one of the big stories, is Brad Binder because he's waiting to make his debut <laughs> and he's just yeah. waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I missed out on the championship last year. What was it? Two points in the end? Yeah, something like that in the end. It was bizarre, wasn't um, it? He, got, he really was, it was close. Um, I just want just one thing about the championship, Neil. Um, 
just in case anyone hasn't seen the latest news, Dorna put out another press release. There's a lot come in. Surprising, actually, how many are coming. But they said racing is our top priority was the headline. Some people have said, well, surely safety should be your top priority, you know, um, which... Yeah, I get. But in it, in it, they were quite fair and basically said, look, it, it's really hard to know when we're going to be able to start, but we're aiming to do something. And and something's happened in the last couple of days, I think, Neil. And I'm talking about other sports in this. I know in Germany, they're looking to get the football season back on. Um, starting middle of May, uh, behind closed doors. And and I know in, right. in England as well, they're talking about the football. Um, maybe training from middle of May onwards and then from beginning of June, slotting all their uh, remaining games into a month a couple of months right? yeah obviously they don't have to travel abroad that sort of thing they they can do things behind closed doors in a, in a certain way that possibly can't be done because you know martial safety medical equipment all this sort of thing that you need for a motorcycle race but i just thought it gave a bit of a glimmer of hope for later on in the year i'm trying to be positive in in some way neil i'm yeah, not gonna get that... it back i can hear i can hear straight away the pause yeah it's just well, first of all, I don't think that's going to happen. I can't see him playing football in May. I just can't say that anyway. And you start talking about football, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm half falling asleep. And then my chimp, my inner chimp's getting angry because my inner, my inner voice is going, them footballers, them bloody footballers are, st- are arguing about money. They, they're not, they're not gonna, they don't want to take a pay cut and all that lot's just bizarre. Is that true? I've read a little bit about it. You've got these... Obviously, massive yeah. football clubs, and well, you know, that, that, got, there's a but there's a lot of staff involved in in the running these clubs, and they were all put on yeah on furlough eighty percent yeah. yeah exactly, and then you've got the footballers going well well bloody hell I'm not taking I'm not taking a reduction in my salary what's that all about yeah I find that very bizarre there have been clubs bizarre. I, will, I will point out Leeds United is one of them who instantly Leeds United deferred wages and and so that people didn't lose their jobs and kept getting paid. And Birmingham, I think, was another one. I don't know something at Manchester City, Barcelona were the the model. They they'd had a bit of criticism actually, and then took a seventy percent reduction just so that the your normal people, your little people at the club, who we all know make a club happen, uh, can yeah. keep being paid. I, I do find it bizarre. Um, Dorna again, generally doing things. I, I can't, you know. I all right. I will put on record. I did used to work for Dorna. Um, but I was quite critical of them when I worked for them and I was a communications director there and you know, I was in charge of media but I could be critical because I could see workings from inside but for, I have to say from the outside communication has not always been ideal however the generally and they've, be, they've been paying Moto2 and Moto3 teams they're paying them their normal stipend they're paying them what they should be and they're paying MotoGP teams like, to, help, see, to, to help I, people I keep their jobs that. yeah, yeah it's something I like 50,000 50, euros to a Moto2 team um, a little bit more to MotoGP team, so just to help Fair people play. get through. Yeah, you know? that's and impressive, think, and that's that's good to hear. Well, well, I'm they're losing they're Dorna, losing money so. hand over fist at the moment. So yeah, yeah, I will say they haven't paid me much. So, anyway, I won't be that into it. Um, getting away from. Hang that, on, well, hang on, hang on. What was that <laughs> splutter? I've never heard anything like it. Get it out there. You obviously owed some money. Is this from doing the uh, the presentation at the end of the year? Have you suddenly been paid your invoice? Yeah, yeah, but I, you, can't, you can't do that on this, can you? You can't. I can't. No. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, you you have. To, hang on, you're not editing no. this out, you little weasel. Because I know what you're like. You little weasel. Whenever I say something I shouldn't have said, I always doing. think, oh, Gavel edit that out anyway, and then I listen to it back and go, oh, the bastard didn't. And then I'm thinking, I'm going to but he I'm, agreed with me, and he's edited that bit out. And I send it straight to Andrea Yanone every time. Um, yeah. I, no, uh, right, just, go on. Just, just about um, people on the lockdown. What about Jack Miller? What about what he's been up to? He's at home in Australia. Uh, and I don't think lockdown measures and, and, and that are a serious over there. But he's basically, the best shots of him are in his digger. <laughs> and he's yeah. like submersible or whatever it is that he's got. Like a, a, a water-bound quad bike boat thing and uh yeah building himself motocross track and just endless shots of him flying through the having air fun having a uh, right old time but on the digger's my favorite because the look of concentration on jack's face but it, but it, i mean it is the ultimate self-isolation where he lives he lives in the middle of nowhere doesn't he out in townsville is it it looks like like there will be nobody within a hundred miles of his house so it looks like he's got a perfect setup there 
awesome looking motocross track. It, and it, I knew he was good on a, on a dirt bike, but you watch some of the stuff he's posting. Wow, that kid, that kid could have been a pro motocross rider. He's something else. Yeah, he's, he's, he's. I think he's as wild on a motocross bike and he is on a. Uh, at MotoGP bike. We're hoping to get him on the greatest race in a couple of weeks. We're hoping to get him on the podcast at some point. The problem is dragging him off his track. And also, yeah. I've known Jack for what must be maybe 10 years now, maybe a bit less. I don't know. Anyway, since he, he popped up onto the radar in Europe, came over to live in Germany and he came and did a couple of wild cards. <clears throat> and known his parents, Sonia and Pete, since then. Absolutely brilliant family all round. And, um, I think in that time he's probably about had twenty mobile phones, <laughs> twenty yeah, numbers. I can imagine just, he loses them all the time, and I remember yeah. him losing a passport once. Anyway, um, we're hoping to. We've just got to get the right number to to get hold of him. But uh, yeah, we'll hope to. In the meantime, we've got uh, another um, native English speaking MotoGP rider that isn't Cal Crutchlow, and of course it's Brad Binder this year. Who, as you said right at the top, Neil, second in in. The Moto Two World Championship last year, third the year before, mustn't forget, yep. and uh, before that, 2016 Moto Three World Champion, and did it in some style uh, that year. He's coming to Moto GP, part of the factory KTM team in Moto GP, still to have his racing debut in Moto GP. But he's someone that both of us have seen since he was in the rookies a long, yep. long time ago now, and seen him make his way through. And it's great, isn't it, Neil, to see him get to where he has been because we both rate him. Oh, I mean, what Brad's one of those riders though. When I first watched him, I think it was back in about 2014. It was, I think, it was on the Mahindra back then in Moto Three. He was, yeah. He wasn't. He didn't. He wasn't a standout superstar right at the front every weekend. But there was the odd race where I watched him, and his braking technique is something else. There is no one can brake later on a motorcycle than Brad. Something I'll ask him about actually later when we get him on. And, and I remember him, let me think where it was, German, uh, Germany, the Saxon ring, watching him into turn one, drift the bike in, the Moto3 bike, which is a little, they're harder to back in. You used to see the Moto2 bike slide into a corner, but the Moto3 bikes, they're, they're smaller, stiffer, more rigid, and sort of less forgiving with the smaller mm. tyres. And I watched Brad glide the bike in, drifting it, proper dirt track style, and I thought, bloody hell, that kid's got some talent. And from that point on, I just watched him grow. And it was a pleasure to watch him grow and build confidence. And he wasn't an, what I'd probably call an out-and-out out winner. And then, mm. back in 2016, he won from the back of the grid, if you remember. in Hareth. Hareth, that was it. And I won't it was like this. It. Yeah, it was, it was this moment in his career that it's almost... It, I talk about confidence... The breakthrough moment, that was it. And from that well, point well, it's, on, he's been it's unstoppable, life, hasn't he, Gav? It's a lifetime of confidence, right in that race. Yeah. He's, I remember he stuck yeah. it on pole, was it? And But he'd been using a wrong mapping. Not his fault. That was it. The yeah. technician had put the wrong mapping into the bike. And yeah. then, and we will talk about this, because for me, it's a, an iconic moment in someone's career that, as you rightly say, just instills them with confidence for a lifetime. And he was sent to the back of the grid, and he said... I'm still going to do this. And I think he was 33rd, 34th on the grid. And he came and he went and won. And he won comfortably. Yeah, he destroyed them. Absolutely dis- destroyed them. And from that moment on, Gav, he's a weapon. <laughs> he's one of those riders. As a, as a guy, I really like him. As a rider, I would hate to ride against him. Because he's, he's a pit bull terrier. He, there is no quitting him at all. And he's aggressive. Sometimes he goes slightly over the line. <laughs> but... Hey, the kid can ride a motorcycle, and we've talked about it. We talked about it last year. We're all excited to see him on a MotoGP bike because we know he's going to be there or thereabouts. When we do mention to him, Neil, him winning from the back of the grid, you're not going to come up with any of your own stories, are you? As if I would what talk about myself, an opportunity. Who would do that? It's not about no, me, Gav. It's going to happen. But it's going to happen. Back in 2000, <laughs> if you go back to and watch that Alton Park race, it, there's a lot of similarities. Right, you know. let's, let's call Brad Binder now. <laughs> Come on, let's call him because we're late. Is it working? Call him Brad Binder. I can hear you, Gav. That's good. The main thing is um, we can hear can each hear other. You. And we just would like to hear Mr. Binder down the other end. Can you do a South African accent? I'm trying to call... Oh, no, it was me. I wrote that. 
Hello. Oh, there he is. There he is. Hey, how's it going? Sorry, man. <laughs> do, do not worry about it. I mean, we honestly, we've had bigger farces. So, uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where where people are, sound like they're done a hell. We can actually hear you. Uh, is it? Can you hear me? Well, that's good news. Yeah. Whereabouts are you at the moment, Brad? I'm actually just chilling in, at home in South Africa. Eh? Where Whereabouts so, is home there? Uh, well, I live in I live in a, a little town called Krugersdorp, but it's it's just outside Johannesburg. Okay. Cool. Lovely. And are you all yeah. well? Are you all well? Can you hear Neil on the other end? How are you doing, Brad? But all good, bad, and yourself. Oh, cool. Uh, we are living the dream here, me and Gav. Oh, really? Good man. What, what's happened is, in, during the lockdown, we started this podcast, and I actually thought I'd got an opportunity to spend time away from Gav, and I've found I'm now <laughs> speaking to him on a daily basis. So oh, it's, shit. It, it's not good. It's gone all wrong, I tell you. I don't know why I agreed to do this, but... Oh, well. well. You why can't win them all. Bad? What can you do? Shit uh, happened. <laughs> charming, charming, bro. Yeah. Thanks very much, mate. Hey, what, what, um, how are you dealing with what? What's the lockdown situation in South Africa? Because you know we're all locked indoors. What? What's the? What are the rules um, down there? Well, they were meant to be down so last week. Uh, we were we had, well last night. We had said it was literally one week to go. And then the president said we have, a, have to chill for another 14 days after that. So we still got a good three weeks of lockdown. And here, I presume it's quite similar to there. Like you, any time you're allowed out the house is to go and buy food. Yeah, so, it's, yeah. it's the same here for Tactic. anything. Yeah, I bet. What, what have you got on site at home? What have, have you got anything way to train? Is, is your brother there? Yeah, I'm quite lucky. We've got a little gym here at the house. And... Um, yeah, got my spinning bike and everything I'd need to train properly. So, uh, yeah, training's no issue. The only thing is I can't really go ride at all. So, yeah, that's the only thing I'm really missing out on. But, yeah, Darren's also here. So, it's the the whole family's here. It's quite good. It's nice just to ch to chill, but it's time to get back to action, I reckon. Have, oh. uh, have Trev and Sharon, your parents, have they had enough of you yet? Ah, oh, you know, I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're down to the last week, so I'm kind of getting excited to get back to normal. And then with them telling us we have another two weeks to go, you know, it was a bit, a bit of a damp on things. So, uh, yeah, to think we're practically starting over because it was a three-week lockdown to start with. So, mm. they're basically, it's just about been doubled. Yeah, I think wow. I think it's pretty much the same everywhere that we're uh, we're speaking to people. We've been speaking to people in Italy and Spain. We spoke to Rossi and Marquez on our program the other day, and they're all chomping at the bit to ride. So you're not in the you know you're not the only one who's not riding. I think the only one who's managed to do it at the moment is Jack Miller, just because the amount of space he's got in his backyard and his paddock. <laughs> Yeah, I checked. I saw Jack's been riding, so he's the lucky one at the moment. Eh? Everyone else is just uh, wishing we were him at the moment, I'd imagine. He's going to smoke you all come when you finally get going. <laughs> hey, yeah. hey, Brad, how frustrating is it for you? You wait your whole life to, to, be a, to get into MotoGP. First South African in, what, it must be 20 years or so. Uh, to, to ride in the Premier Class. And your debut's just been delayed and delayed. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I'm definitely I'm not a MotoGP rider as of yet. So, uh, oh let's really, see. really, we well, th we think we class you as a MotoGP rider now, Brad. Come on. Uh, I don't know, mate. I'm meant to be, meant to be, but this whole Corona thing's put a uh, stopping me at the moment. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's weird. Yeah, I mean, you guys know how it is when when Valencia's over, you just practically count down the days and you prepare for that first race in Qatar again. So. Um, Regardless whether you, you move classes or not, you know, it's like a big build up and it's something you look forward to. So when that all kind of falls away, you know, it's it's a bit of a strange feeling. And especially at the moment when there's so much uncertainty, like no one knows when we're gonna be riding again, if we're going if we're going to be racing this year. And uh it's just it's quite tough, you know. I mean you're just training every day and hoping for the best, but you're not really getting any any feedback at the moment? Because the weird thing, Neil, isn't it, that, that the guys did all the pre-season testing right up to Qatar, you know, right up well, yeah. pretty much till two weeks before the start of the year. So it's like you had a full season, full preparation, you're peaking at the right moment and suddenly it's all ripped away from you. And we know for good reason 
but all that preparation, you know what goes into it. Yeah, it, it, and that's frustrating, but it's, it's even worse for Brad because, again, you've I'm watching how he's gone through testing. He, he sort of took his time, he's methodically been working out how to adapt to a MotoGP bike. And if you saw, we went on at the last test on the last day, it was like he just timed everything perfect, you know, and it, it worked his way up from being near the back of the group, like I say, trying to figure out the puzzle. But by the end of testing, he was really getting somewhere. But what Brad needed was then to be on track and actually have a couple of races to really understand the secrets, the incretises. Oh, my God. What was that? Have you got your teeth in this morning? Hang on a minute. (laughs) Have you left them on the bedside table again? I've just looked, and it's it's vodka I'm drinking, not water this morning. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, airport rules apply on lockdown. Hey, it's good. Yeah, you can drink any time on lockdown. And that was something I was told, actually. In South Africa, you can't buy alcohol. Is that right? Yeah, at the moment, all the, all the shops are uh, closed. Well, yeah, no one can buy cigarettes or alcohol. But, I mean, when you live in... When there's a will, there's a way. So, uh, I'm oh, wait, sure. Oh, it's moonshine. Hey. Moonshine. Moonshine. I can imagine. Yeah, that's it, bud. <laughs> yeah, what but, can you do that? Yeah, it's a nightmare, that. But, yeah, for Brad, he, he just needed to get out on track. So, it, it's I, all, I, I genuinely feel like it's worse for, for the rookies that were just desperate. And Alex Marquez is the same, isn't he? You know, like, you just need to get some races under your belt. Then you can understand where you're at. Mm. And actually, in race situations, that's where you learn everything. And that's where you... After a race, you, you come back and think, wow, that, that I'm so weak on, let's say, uh, the exit of the corners. I'm, I'm obviously burning the tyre out too early on. Or I'm way too aggressive on the brakes. I'm guessing that's what Brad's going to be. I'm trying to make up too much time on the brakes. <laughs> and I'm rushing... I'm rushing the corners, you know, like, but but then you figure that 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 puzzle out. So it, it's it's definitely a tough time for the rookies. How was it, Brad? Then how was testing um, at the end of last year, beginning of this year? Uh, what what about that process? As you mentioned, right from Valencia through to Qatar, uh, tell us about that evolution and, and the work that's been put in. Yeah, I mean, you know, I definitely I didn't want to rush things when I to make well as soon as I made the step up. Um, you know, that com- coming from Moto2 to MotoGP is a, it's another world, you know, the way you need to ride the bike, the way uh, you need to <clears throat> just basically go about things, you know, it's just so different. You need to prepare everything so much better and uh, be so much more clean and precise, it seems. So, um, you know, it, t- it, was t- it took a, lot of, a long time to try and just find my feet, but the thing is, it's just each day I saw a little bit of progress and I felt more and more comfortable. And step by step, you know, things just started to come into that little bit, uh, I wouldn't say easier, but just felt more confident and I was getting a little bit closer to the to the front guys. So, um, yeah, you know, it it was like Neil was saying earlier, The what I really needed was to, to get a couple of races under, under my belt because then you get the opportunity to really see what's going on. Mm. Um, you can only learn testing, so much from testing, can't you? That's it. You know, if I've maybe done in total, say, 10 laps behind a, a, like some of the other riders over all of my test days, uh, that would be it, you know. And I find each time I go behind someone, I see something that's so important that you know, it makes a huge change straight away. So um, I think being in that race situation where everyone's just going for it and you can really have a good opportunity to see where what your strong points are, your weaknesses, and uh, from there it's easy to build, you know. So, uh, yeah, we missed out on that one, but what can you do? Just going to have to wait and hopefully it comes soon. Brad, what for you, by following riders, you've done all these tests... Has there been a few standout moments? Who have you followed where you've thought, wow, how do you, like, almost how do you do that? Or how is he doing that? Uh, you know, at the beginning, especially in Valencia, I mean, I was like more than two seconds off the pace. Every single guy that would pass me would disappear within like three corners. So <laughs> it, it, it really sucked, you know, but... Um, it was, it, it was, it's just crazy to see, like, the, the, the main thing I noticed is just how the guys, how quickly they get the bike turn and how quickly they get it up straight, you know, onto the, onto the straights. Yeah. And the, the speed that they could get that at and, like, how, how tight they could get the bike over the inside curbs was really impressive to me. And uh, it was one of, I think that's one of the big things I'm going to have to learn uh, going forward in MotoGP is just 
that ability to really get the bike turned super quickly and get the get onto the good part of the tire and get that drive onto the straight. And from from the just quickly from the from a human side, what did it feel like the first time you followed Valentino Rossi? You know, like because we you, everyone grows up, he's the god, he's our hero, it's it's Rossi, and you're on the track with him. What, what was that moment like? Yeah, it was awesome. You know, he was actually one of the first guys I, I got a chance to follow. So, at the, and and same thing like um, you know when I when when he was in front of me. I was trying to keep up, but I just kept going straight in every single corner because I would kind of just outbreak myself and go straight, you know, and I was so scared I was going to ride into the back of him. <laughs> so, oh, you know, it's like one of those things that's your hero from when you when from well, since I can remember. And, uh, yeah, to have him in front of you is unbelievable. So it's going to take a bit of getting used to, I'm sure. <laughs> that's Brian, brilliant. obviously, South Africa is famous for its wildlife, for its animals, right? So describe the KTM on first contact with it. What what was it like? What kind of animal would you describe it as? Yeah, I think uh, I don't think it would be much of an African animal. I can just think of like a raging bull. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hectic. Like at the beginning, the first initial laps were so were, were crazy. You know, I think it, uh, honestly, I think it would be any MotoGP bike in general, just with that that type of power, you know, and the way they mm. stop and the amount of grip you have are, is insane. So, it's just a whole lot of factors that kind of weigh in, and you, you, it's unbelievable, really, at the beginning. But saying that, it's like anything, you know, the more laps you do, I mean, I remember after the six days in Sepang, like at the end of the back straight, it didn't feel crazy anymore, you know, it just. It kind of feels like you back on your Moto Two bike kind of thing, so you do get used to it, you know. But that initial like first five six laps is something that you could never like. I can't even explain. It's incredible. It, it just takes, I suppose, some recalibration, Neil, doesn't it? To to when you when you switch from a bike which has got only a certain amount of power, and I know the Triumph was a little bit more than the six hundred, but still nothing like a Moto GP bike. It is to recalibrate your brain. Everything comes at you at a different speed. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much double the speed, uh, uh, double the brake horsepower, certainly. And it, those first laps that Brad's talking about, it's not fun. It's actually, everything's happening too fast. The noise of the bike, the way it feels, the way it accelerates, it accelerates and it starts to want to wheelie and they, they sort of like drift off. And you, you, you like, you're in a situation where, he's, where Brad will be riding his Motor 2 bike and he's 100% in control of it. He can do what he wants put the bike where he wants, it's, it's like a dance. You jump on a MotoGP bike and it's this thing dragging you around a track. You look down at your lap time, you're puffing and panting and you think, oh my God, look how slow I am. Like, like literally, they are so bizarre to ride and it, it just takes days and days of understanding. And like Brad said, by the end of six days at Sepang, it starts to feel more normal. But that, those first days on a GP, but MotoGP bike, and your hands are killing you, your legs are aching, you hold your breath because of the anxiety of riding these bikes, because they are scary. You know, it's, it, it's an incredible experience. It really is. So if there was one thing, Brad, that stuck out of you, that jumped out of you in, these, in this getting to know you period with you and the, uh, and the KTM, what would it be? Uh, it, you know, I think it's just the, just the power in general. Um, you know, just how much you have underneath you. And, you know, also a lot to do with the electronics. You know, you want more and more power, but at the same time, how much you can use is the trick. Mm. Uh, you know, I remember on the first the first couple of exits, I came in and I was telling the guys how insanely fast it was. And they were kind of like, well, you know, you should try revving the thing because I'm shifting way too early. <laughs> so I wasn't really <laughs> using the power. So. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. But um, yeah, just just have to really buckle down and take my time. You know, I think nothing's going to happen overnight. But uh, the more laps you do, the better things feel. And obviously, the better you feel, the quicker you go. And did you feel supremely confident in winter? Bearing in mind, you won the last three races of last year. You finished the season three points behind. We'll talk about that in a second, uh, about the frustrations of last season. But you 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 know you were on a crest of a wave yeah the the end of last year was really positive 
and then um, I stepped onto the MotoGP bike, and and both tests I was in last position. So <laughs> it, it just knocked really, you back down to earth. Yeah, I was really like, oh, this is great, and then it's like, oh, geez, I got a bit of work to do. But uh, <laughs> it, it was cool, you know. I think it it actually helped me in the long run because I really just took a week off as soon as I got back home, and then from then on, I was just training and trying to prepare for my MotoGP. Well, MotoGP first race, but uh, yeah, still waiting for that one. It'll come. It will come. It will come, Brad. And the the thing I want to know is, I know you're a KTM employee still, still so there's probably certain things you're not able to say and not allowed to say uh, because the contract, they're, they're probably, you know, arguing about paying you. My, anyway, uh, my point being is last year, um, KTM, um, it was a weird Moto2 year. For you. you you missed out on the championship by three points in the end i'd want to know how you you see that but it's weird the bike didn't work for the first half of the year and then suddenly it turned into a, a world beater with you on board uh, yeah at the beginning i mean i don't even know where to start um you know at, at the originally at, at the end of the the 2018 season when we first rode the bike you know we went into the winter knowing that things weren't great and uh, I was really hoping that the guys would redesign the thing completely and would start the season with something that would, would be completely uh, different to what we had, you know, because it was quite obvious that it wasn't working from the get-go. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I think we just didn't really get that step that we needed over the winter break. And uh, we ended up starting the season with something very similar to what we, what we had in the testing. So, uh, yeah, from then on, you know, I mean, the first race, I ended up finishing my rear tire with like six laps to go. I was already through to the canvas. So, mm. I mean, then already you realize something's not right. So, uh, you know, it wasn't just the speed that was missing. It was also the performance over race. So um, we had a lot of work to do. The, I, I mean, we went through endless amounts of frames, swing arms, uh, different front fork settings, rear shocks. But at the end of the day, nothing was really working. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, they kind of gave me a, a different frame when we got to Lamar. And things started to work more or less all right, you know. So from then on, it was just basically tampering with the small things. And uh, from then on, we, we ended up getting the bike better and better every weekend. And by the end of the year, we're on a really, really good bike. Is there a sense of frustration then to finish the year three points behind almost... You know, in the knowledge of, man, this this should have been ours. This should have been our title. D is that there? It, it is a, it is on one hand, but on the other hand, you know, I went from fighting for points <laughs> at like the first five, six races of the year. I remember quite, uh, quite well, to say the least, was Mugello and Barcelona, where I was race. I literally was fighting as hard as I could for 15th position in Mugello. Mm and in Barcelona, 12th position. So, you know, it's on one hand, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed, but on the other hand, I think it's, it's made me a much better rider at the end of the day, much stronger, especially mentally, because, you know, it's one thing when you, when you don't really know what you're capable of and you're getting those results, but when you really believe and know that you can be up there fighting for podiums and wins, and then you're down in 15th, you know, it's, it's tough. And uh, to, to work our way out of that hole was great. And to finish the year the way we did was awesome. So, you know, I think second place in the championship, if you look at the way we started, we can't complain. We need to be happy about it and uh, on to the next adventure now. But I wonder, we, we, let's move away generally. I want to have one last question, though, about the actual race inside of things. And that is about, obviously, you won the, the Moto3 title. And that season... Uh, when you won it um, back in 2016, wasn't it? The um, the race in Jerez, right? You were on pole position. You got sent to the back of the grid and you won from the back of the grid. Do you, does that go down for you? We were talking about it just before we spoke to you, about it being an iconic moment in anyone's career that fills you with a lifetime of confidence. How do you? Is that one that always comes back to you as being the most special thing? Um, I would say so. You know, it's difficult to choose one race. Obviously, there's, I've, especially lately, you know, I've had a few that come to mind as they've been quite quite good for me, of course. But um, 
the thing with their rathal is you know i'd never won a race before and uh obviously i'd been in moto three for i think already four years at the time so uh you know to to win my race on the on a day when things were all stacked against me uh having to start in last position was amazing and i think that just really set the tone for the rest of the season i think that's pretty much what gave me the boost to really uh Go ahead and get the job done. What What do you think, Brad? Though made the difference on that day because, like you said, you'd done four seasons in in the class. You'd never won one, and all of a sudden, you win one, and then you you couldn't stop winning. But what changed that day? Was it the fact that you'd been put to the back of the grid and you thought, basically, screw screw these lot. I'm going to show them who the man is. What What changed? Honestly, I don't really know. I think more than anything, it just came down to the fact that I had really, really good rhythm throughout the weekend. You know, I think that day, regardless whether I started first or last, I would have won. So the the thing the thing is with that, it's just really, I don't know. I think everything was just building up to that moment. And um, I had had a good pace. I felt strong. The bike was unbelievable. Um, you know, the team and I had done a, had done a great job in the testing in Jerez before then. And uh, just felt really ready and and uh, was excited to get going. So to to come out and walk away with my first victory like that was was an incredible feeling. Uh, it's definitely a day that I'll never forget. And uh, yeah, you know, I think that's that's one of the days in my life so far that that I'll definitely uh, never forget. I suppose that's the only way I can put it. I, yeah. I, love the, I love the line in there, Neil. So far. So far. So, so far. That, that's, I love that. But that's the right that, attitude, that, isn't it? Yeah, you exactly. Have, you, there's so much more to come. Yeah. Well, how old are you now, Brad? I don't even, what are you, like 25? Uh, 24 now, turning 25 in August. Right, yeah. So you're not even at the, the, the prime of your career. I, I see most motorcycle races. The prime is, I think you're at your, your, your absolute pinnacle of your career, around about 27, I'd say. And then... You know, each ride is different, but from 27 to 30, they should be your absolute golden years. I know that's quite a scary thing to say when you look at what Mark Marquez has achieved. There's always certain people, <laughs> freaks of nature, that can do something slightly different. But that's how I see most people's careers. And I guess you will feel like that now, won't you? You're in the pr- premier class and now you want the next five years of your career to really define who you are as a rider. For sure, you know, the, the goal is always to get into MotoGP. Um, you know, to me, Moto3 and Moto2 are the stepping stones. And uh, from here on out, it's now I'm in the, I'm at the, pin, in the pinnacle of the sport, you know, with the, the best guys in the world. So uh, it's it, now, I, it's, a, it's a new challenge. A question, and I wrote this down because obviously we, we knew we were going to speak to you. It, it might sound like a strange question and... The fact that you've not done a MotoGP race yet it might make it more difficult to answer. But with what you've seen, and you've seen all the races, how on earth do you beat Mark Marquez? <laughs> uh, you know, I think I think you've got to be in the right place at the right time. And because if he's on, if he's right behind you, you know he's going to give it a good go. So, uh... but you ride you ride similar, don't you, Brad? The way you ride, your aggression on track, it's like you are you are the ultimate. Jacqueline Hyde character, as in off the bike, you're a real calm, polite, smiley, nice person. On the bike, you're a killer, aren't you? And Marquez is. You have it. No, but you you ride very you ride very aggressive. You take no prisoners, and there's no you never give in. There's no quits. It's not like oh, Binder's in second now. We'll probably take it'll, it'll take a second place here. It's like no, he, he's not giving up yet. He's, he can. He thinks he can win this, you know, and Marcus is like that. Do, do you think you've got a similar, those, you know, you share those similar traits? Uh, you know, I think if I, if I can see the opportunity, I always uh, seem to uh, find a way to make the best of it. But, um, yeah, you know, it, it's tough. You know, some days uh, it, it's, you know, when you're in a big group, especially and stuff like that, you've got to fight hard and... Uh, yeah, that's one thing I'm not not shy of doing. So it's one thing I've always enjoyed. That's some of my favorite moments in races, always when you're getting stuck in uh, with the other guys. But uh, yeah, I suppose that is one of my trades. I've always been quite aggressive. And um, yeah, I think it's just to find the balance, to be honest. 
But yeah. uh, I think racing against Mark is a different story. I mean, yeah. he's he's an animal. But uh, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, that that's all to come, I'm sure. Um, I want to go. You've both got someone in common in your careers, uh, Brad. You and Mark, and that's Aki Ayo, who you've obviously now been with what five years? Is it five years? I suppose this will be. Uh, you're not really uh, with him in his team anymore, but you know through that old KTM system that that you know he's been tied into for a while. Tell us about Aki and what's so special. Why has he helped Mark go to a title and yourself go to a title and Mike D'Amelio before that? What what what's he got that's that's unique there? Yeah, I mean I've been with Aki since twenty fifteen was my first season with him. So I've been um been with him and his team for a long time now. And uh yeah, you know, I think the thing with Aki is he has, they have such a great uh, work ethic in the team. He's got unbelievable people that work for him. And, uh, you know, he's he's the ultimate boss to have. You know, he's when you, when things are going great, he's always there. And when things, the, if he sees one thing that's not perfect, you know, he's de- always the first guy to, to tell you. Um, I think with Aki, you know, there's, uh, I don't really know how to say it in the correct terms, but um, there's like a no bullshit policy. <laughs> That is the perfect that's, uh, yeah. terms for this podcast. <laughs> yeah, we get that. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, you know, he's, if he sees something, he's going to let you know about it. You know, he always tells you straight. And I think that's what's, what's given him so much, so much success in, with his team. Uh, you know, he's always there to, to check up on things. It doesn't matter if you win the race by 10 seconds, you know, if there's something there that he sees we can improve, you know, he's the first guy to let us know. So uh, I think the one, one thing that really sticks out with him is it doesn't matter how great things are. Um, you know, there's always things to improve and they're, they're always pushing to make things better and better. So um, yeah, you know, I have to say a huge thank you to Aki and his team because uh just when I started with them, I really had a lot to learn. And uh, the month they, they taught me over all those years was unbelievable. And they made me a much, much better rider. So I can't thank them he, enough. He always seems to me like the calmest man in the world when everything around him is this chaos. Is he like that? Is he, is that does he transmit that to you? Yeah, I think, you, you know, for, for the boss to really um, get up tight, there's got to be a lot going on. You know, I think he's... I think he's been in the game for so many years that there's not much that phases him anymore. I think he really likes to keep things simple, um, focus on what's important and what he can control. And, uh, you know, the other things kind of can sort themselves out. But, you know, I think that's one one quality he has that's really, really uh, great is that he, he really just f- puts a lot of focus into the box, you know, and what we can change uh, regardless of what the situation is. Um, how good things are going or how difficult things are. You, you know, the the efforts in the box and the work ethic is always the same. And I think that's one thing that uh, has just been carrying him through all the years. It is a question for you then, Brad. For the young racers that are listening to our podcast, we get a, a lot of young British racers. What advice has Aki given you? You talk about, you know, you've been with him five years and it's made a massive difference. Could you... Could you give us a, f- a few examples just so that the young kids that are listening that are racing, you know, you can help them a little bit? Yeah, you know, over the five years, it's difficult to just choose a few things. But, um, you know, the one thing that we always, always did was always focus on the race pace. You know, the once off laps was never really one thing that we put any, well, too much th- thought into or too much effort. You know, we always were there working on our rhythm. And uh, setting the bike up to be great over over the twenty lap period or however many laps the race may be, you know I think the, and also another thing is you when you're on track you you're pushing your hardest you know and uh, there's no such thing as like sitting up waiting for a toe that's the kind of things that don't don't sit well with Aki of course you know there's a, always a time where you end up um, you know goofing around on track a little bit or something like that and you know it's never never a good thing you always just end up wasting your own time so i think the one really important thing i learned from him is you always just focus on yourself and do your best job and if you do the work right the lap time will come and you so will the results how funny though you, you say that and then you you see 
the first race, because the Moto2 race happened in Qatar, and Nagashima, who's never won a race before, rides for Akiayo, his first race, and wins. I'll, you, know, I'll, you know, that's not a coincidence, is it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the, the thing that's so amazing for me that I, I really, I, I took so much joy out of watching Nagashima win that race because it's, it's all my old crew, you know. So yeah, um, to see all those guys, you know, they won the last three races last year and to come and start the new season with a new rider and come in and win, you know, I think it, it just shows their class. Also, you know, I think Nagashima is an amazing rider for sure. And uh, he did an amazing job, but uh, you know the the team has so much. It, it's that's the thing of racing. As much as you are on track alone, you have this huge team behind you, and without them, you know, I think it would obviously be impossible. But um, yeah, they just they there's so much input there, and there's so many great people that are that are there to help you go forward. Right, I've got I've got a question that ties into both those things about having people around the right people around you at the right times. Uh, and that's about, um, and as well, being a young rider and what you improve, how on earth does a South African, you and your brother, how on earth do you two get to this level? How on earth have you been the first South African, well, you're about to be the first South African in, in MotoGP in 20 years? I think Sean, Shane Norval was the last one. Is that right? If I'm thinking back off the top of my head. How, how on earth do you get into that position in the first place? Because it's not been an easy road, has it? It's been a long, long, long... Um... It's been an adventure, that's for sure. I don't even know where to start. But, um, yeah, I mean, at the beginning, I started off, started off uh, just, actually, the first time I ever left South Africa to go overseas was with my dad when we were, I was 12 years old. So, you know, we, we started to come over to Europe when I was really young. And then from then on, I just, uh, yeah, went into Red Bull Rookies Cup. And step by step, you know, we just tried to, uh, make our way uh, into MotoGP and finally we're going to get the opportunity to give it a go. Yeah, but you're holding up the, the flag for the country who uh, you've got um, obviously amazing history in the likes of Corky Ballington who, who come from South Africa and, and we always used to have a race and it used to be a big part of the championship but that hasn't been the case for a long time. Uh, in terms of, of, I don't know, in terms of the motorcycle culture uh, in South Africa and, and getting people to this level, is it all set up or have you, have you found it tough going to get there? You surely have, you and your parents having to, to move over to Europe, that kind of thing. It's been, it, was, it was really, really extremely tough. I mean, um, you know, for me as a kid, it was always just really a dream, you know, but for for my parents at the end of the day, that's where the real harsh reality comes in. Um, you know, if I look back now and see the things that they did, it's unbelievable. You know, uh, my first year of MotoGP, my mom lived with me in Spain. And uh, my brother, who was probably like 13 years old, 12, 13 at the time, was living at home uh, with my dad. So, you know, mm. it was like close enough to a year apart. Obviously, we saw each other in between every now and then, but not too often. Um, you know, it, it's, it was tough. It was difficult at the beginning. My uh, parents gave up so much to help me get there. And yeah, you know, I, I'm so fortunate to be in this situation right now. And uh, without my dad doing all the, all the things we did do at the beginning, uh, we all know this would be impossible. So yeah, I mean, hats off to them. It's, I can't thank them enough. And, and are you a massive star over there at the moment? Are you the big cheese, one of the big cheeses in sport? Come on, be honest with us. It is. Uh, I can answer that because I was in Cape Town for two week, for two weeks, and you go past garages and there's there's like pictures of him everywhere. Honestly, he's 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 kind of a big deal in South Africa, and bloody rightly <laughs> so. But he is. He won't say it, but he is. He's, he, he's the real deal. He's a bit of a star over there, you know, Gav. No, nah, it's not not that bad. That's for sure. <laughs> Come on, I bet you are. I bet you're up there with the. The rugby players and what have you. I'd be loving it. Come on, admit it. <laughs> Tell me you've been to part. You you went to the. I don't know. You must have been to one of the rugby world cup winning parties or something like that. You've been to one of those receptions, haven't you? No, I can't say I have, eh, bud. But I oh, mean, come to on. be honest, it is cool. You know, I have so much support here in South Africa. It's actually unbelievable. Um, you know, and I think as as things have come on from Moto Three and Moto Two and the results and everything have started to come. 
And now, especially with the step up into MotoGP, you know, I feel like I have the whole country behind me. And the amount of support that I, like, I have, like I said earlier, is insane. You know, it's like um, going to the shops and things nowadays. Uh, people seem to recognize me, which I find really strange. But uh, Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him. It, do you know what? Archie loves it. He sees it as a chance to get his top off. Uh, what what about... Hey, hang on. Um, one, one question, though. You say all that, okay, Brad, but what does it feel like to be South Africa's number two motorcycle racer behind Lance Isaacs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah hey, number it's, three it's, behind it's, number three behind Darren Binder as well. Yeah. Uh, especially when I'm in Cape Town, I definitely come second to Lance, that's for sure. But, uh, He's, Lance is my new hero, you know. You know, obviously, I spent a lot of time with him out there on holiday, so... And I can't believe Lance... I can't remember... Lance is similar age to me and he's still racing isn't he in the south african superbike championship yeah lance is he's a legend here in south africa i mean he's he's been i mean he was racing here in and in world superbikes you know when i was he's probably still in nappies <laughs> so yeah he's been around a while or lance but um you know it's been awesome for me because he's been he's always been someone i've looked up to here in south africa and um now that I'm a bit old, a bit older, you know, he's he's a good mate of mine, and it's always always awesome to go out with Lance and just have a good time. So, he likes a glass of wine, doesn't he? Yeah, he likes more than wine. That's for sure. <laughs> <He> likes, <laughs> good old Lance. Hey, I've got. Uh, he's obviously you mentioned the South African Superbike Championship. So, what are the chances of us going back to South Africa? I'd heard rumours that they were trying to put something together about us racing again um, in South Africa. Do you know anything about that, Brad? Um, you know, I've, there has been some talk of trying to get MotoGP back here. Uh, I think it will be extremely difficult. You know, at the moment, I know we, we've been in some, well, I've had some discussions with people and it, so, it sounds like there's, you know, everyone's got the, the same mindset that we want to bring MotoGP back, but we need a bit of government backing for sure. Mm. And um, if we can get that right, I'm sure that we'll see see MotoGP back here. When exactly where, where, that will be, I have no idea, though. And where? Where would it be? Would it would it be Velcom? Would it be Kyle Army? Is Velcom still exist as a track? You know, that, that's the thing. I was actually, I, I was there in December. I went to go check it out, and uh, the track's still there. The guys still race there every now and then, but um, it hasn't really been touched too much since the last uh, MotoGP was here, and I think that was 2004. So it needs a good resurface that's for sure and uh you know i think the, the good thing with that is we have all the facilities there and everything they just need a bit of an upgrade yeah you'll remember 2004 at Velcom, won't you now yeah well i was in the race but <laughs> i don't remember seeing valentino rossi or anyone up front all all i know is I, I felt like i was there to protect valentino from behind you know, it was a big, it was a big race for him on the Yamaha, his, his debut on the Yamaha, and I'd spoke to him beforehand, and I said, "I'm going to float around 17th, 18th. I'll just make sure there's no one doing anything silly back here." And that, do you know what? I did my job good. We well, did you know? because he pulled in after eight laps. Right? Yeah, because I ran out of fuel with eight. No, with eight laps to go. Eight laps eight. To go that was it. Brad, that's when you know you're in a good team. When you run out of fuel with eight laps to go, you're like, "Hang on a minute, we weren't even close to finishing." <laughs> oh God, that was awful. That was awful. That does not sound like fun. South Africa is a long way to come to run out of petrol, but... Oh, God, tell me about it. Do you know what, actually? I wouldn't have minded running out of petrol if I was riding around the beautiful Kyle Army, which is one of my favourite circuits I've ever been to. So if, if there is any chance of them getting that circuit on the, on the MotoGP calendar, I'll tell you what, everybody will be in for a treat. I'm sure you've been around that place, haven't you? I have. I've been around the old track, and the the new track is even better. They actually just oh, wow. finished redoing it all, so it would be amazing to get MotoGP back here, especially to Kailami. To be honest, because yeah. it's not too far from home. I could actually sleep in my own bed and then go to a MotoGP race, which would be something new. That's for oh, sure. That'd be awesome. That'd Imagine be a treat. To do that one. That'd be like all those who live in Barcelona and they come to that race. <laughs> when they do. Hey, I've got I've got a good story actually about Velcom. The last time, actually, must have been when you were there, Neil. My um, my bag never turned up. Uh, getting down to Joburg when we when we flew down there, and it's what is it about two and a half hours, isn't it, down to to Velcom from Joburg? Anyway, my bag didn't ever come. It came the Sunday night we were leaving. <laughs> so I spent I spent all week in um, you know just in borrowed clothes, and <laughs> also I was I was sharing a room with uh, Matt Roberts 
off the telly. And um, we we used to get billeted out because there weren't enough hotels. So you'd stay with families and, and that kind of thing. And we stayed with in this it was old boarding school, but it was like a boarding house. And we were all in this place. And they ran out of water that week. So not only did I have no clothes, I was showering under a rusty, dripping tap. That was it for the whole oh week. It was scorching hot. It was horrible. It was the most horrible experience <laughs> of my life of that oh whole week in Belkin. We had a good we had a good time down there. But I tell you what, it was uh, yeah, it was <laughs> a, a horrific week. I, I, it made me go. I don't want to get back. I don't want to come back. It, it Wait, if we go to like Kyle Army. I'll take that. Argentina. <laughs> Yeah, it was a similar kind of experience as going to Argentina. Uh, it was a rusty tap, I remember, dripping. That was our uh, our shower for the week. It was awful. It was I, awful. I think on that note, Gav, it's time for my quick fire round. Oh, but, God. So, yeah, Brad... I thought you wouldn't have had time to prepare these. Go on. Uh, well, I've, I've been scribbling them down whilst we talk. Brad, every special guest we get in, I do a little quick fire round, just so we get to know you a little bit better. It's just a few questions, sort of one word each answers... <laughs> Um, there's some challenging questions coming up so you know be prepared you know it's not this is high level this is a high level interview right so it's not news night so get ready quick question number one mcdonald's or kfc uh mcdonald's good lad beer or wine uh beer who was your biking hero valentino Right. Oh, well, my next question was Rossi or Marquez. So you've, uh, you've answered that. So got my questions wrong. Right. This is the main, this is, I'm building up to this question. World Superbikes was always popular in South Africa. <laughs> Who's your favourite ex-World Superbike champion? <laughs> <coughs> oh, jeez. You know, it's going to be a difficult one. I'd always say foggy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, what? What? Uh, I, uh, I'm gonna have to go you... check her. Uh, yeah, uh, I love it. Right. Yes, you good chat. Him. Anyway, nice to have you on. Nice to have you on this call. We'll uh, right. Moving on. Let me just text. Who can we get next? What? So <laughs> Darren Binder. Get on. We actually with Darren. Hey, let's have a quick word about about Dazzler, um, and and uh, how he's getting on. Uh, how how about his start to the season? Well, Daz, he was on fire till one lap. He was to go. <laughs> until the until the first corner on the last lap, was it? Yeah, oh, shame, man. Poor kid. Uh, you know, I think he he's got so much uh, so much talent, and I'm just waiting for him to get it right. You know, he's been so unlucky so many times. He's got a lot of fight in him. I'm just waiting for that final good result to come out. But he you know he, he, he he needs, needs that break, breakthrough moment like you yeah. had. He really does, doesn't he? I honestly believe that he needs one good race. You know, one really good race can go such a long way. And he's been up there and fighting so hard with the guys so many times. And he just hasn't quite really got that opportunity to uh, be stand on the top step of the podium yet. But, I mean, if, from what I've seen, I'm sure it's coming. Yeah. I mean, we all know what a, how much that can help help a rider. So, I yeah. think that's exactly what he needs right now. Yeah, the, the one thing coming. for me is we talk about you, Brad, being a Jekyll and Hyde, and I think Daz is even more so, isn't he? Because on track, he is as fierce as they come. I mean, takes no prisoners whatsoever. But off track, he is the most laid... He's so laid back, he's horizontal. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think when I watch my brother on track, I literally, I sometimes feel like I'm going to die before my Moto2 race because <laughs> when I'm just watching him I literally feel like I'm going to have a heart attack so that adrenaline watching hectic. your brother you never that. know what you're going to get with Darren that's the thing you know so like oh you do of, yeah, you do know I, I, you know you get a show <laughs> you're going to get a show what is it though about Darren he doesn't like qualifying Darren Darren has to give everyone a head start, doesn't it? It's like, yeah. it's like, here's Darren Binder. I'll have a chat to Darren Binder on row eight, you know. <laughs> and then by the end of lap five, it's, and in first place, it's <laughs> Darren Binder. Incredible, incredible. I think he likes to go to bed and happy on a Saturday night. It makes him faster or something because when he qualifies well, it never seems to be great. But when he qualifies at the back, there's always some fire there's in the some morning. Fire. Or and, and, and tell us, is... I'm, I'm very good friends with the McKenzie family. Um, Taryn and Taylor McKenzie are best mates. They really are. And, and they're great rivals, but in a real healthy way. They train together. There's always a bit of a competition going on, but it's, it's a real fun element. Obviously, I'm very close to the Lowe's twins. That's similar. 
Is it the same with you and your brother? Do you do, you do a lot of training together, etc.? It is, you know, I think it, it's not really any different, to be honest. I mean, Darren and I live together, so, you know, we go training, training today, <clears throat> every single day together. And, um, you know, if I go riding, he comes with. If we cycle, we cycle together, gym, gym together. So, you know, I think it's great, especially for, for us coming from South Africa. Um, you know, when you're, in, when you're in Europe for such a long period of time, to have someone to really go ride with and train with and everything and especially just live with makes life so much easier. I think without it, it would have been a lot more tough, but um, yeah. it definitely makes the long away from home much, much, much more pleasant. It's similar to me and Gav, isn't it, Gav? It's similar to me and you, though. We've got each other to, <clears throat> you know, to tra- we train together, we push each other to the absolute limits. I mean, look mm. at you at the moment. I mean, what, what's the body fat down to at the moment? We, you know, uh, I think we're in the single we're in what, single figures. Single? What, does, what does thirty count as single? <laughs> not really. <laughs> not really. You, you're not thirty. Hey, we push each other on to new heights in the pub. That's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> that is all that matters. Hey, uh, I just wonder, Brad, Brad, have you two raced on track together? Darren and I. Yeah. Was there yeah. a year you were together? Was we're that... in Moto3 in 2015 and 16 15 together. 15 and 16 together. Oh, yeah. yeah, I just wondered if you'd had any shady movers put on you by him or vice versa. Um, uh, I think luckily for me, when I, was, when I won the championship, I was up front and he was probably like yeah. midfield at that time. So it was a good thing because we couldn't really get stuck into each other. But, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be that guy that's going to be clean and make sure I don't bump my brother off, but I'll... Oh, Daz, you'll put me in the bush without an issue. <laughs> I can guarantee it. That's what I was going to say. I can imagine between brothers. That's got, I'm surprised the Aspargo brothers haven't done it more because there must be a that, that level of needle there. Must be. Yeah, you know, no one wants to go home being the slower brother, so... Because <laughs> <laughs> it rumbles on, there's nothing worse than it. Right, we better let you go, Brad, because we've had you uh, for far too long taking up your time. We appreciate it massively, you coming on. What have you got lined up for the Easter weekend? But a whole lot of nothing at the moment. I mean, we're in lockdown, so uh, yeah. uh, I'll try to have a bri, maybe, hopefully. A bri, exactly. Well, that's what I was hoping you were going to say, a something what? like that. A what? A bri. A barbecue, mate. What's that? A bri, oh, you know. I... He knows. He's just being the goat, surely, surely. No, I actually <laughs> didn't know. Son, you can't, can't, couldn't have come to Cape Town and not had a bra, my bro. No, well, n- next time. I'm coming again, as you know. <laughs> I'm coming again. Going to have to have a chat to Lawrence. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you've got to have one out on the barbecue, chucking big hunks of meat on it and uh, drinking a few Castle Lagers or something like that. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> good to me. That's, that's all I remember from South Africa. Uh, right, well, um, send our regards to your parents, to your brother as well. And uh, we honestly, so thankful to uh, have you on, Brad. And um, we cannot wait to see you out on track in MotoGP. Um, it can't be too soon, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed for that one. And you take care of yourself. Oh, I can't wait. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks so much for having me on the show. It's been awesome. Perfect. Uh, Top man. Top man. Cheers, awesome. mate. You take care. Shate, guys, look after yourself. Have a good one. Yeah, and Cheers, you do. See you. Bye bye. Bye. I love, I love Brad so much. He's such a down to earth good guy, isn't he? He's, that's 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 everything we know about him. You know, like you've known him longer than me, Gav, haven't you? Really, you've you've you saw him basically make his debut back in Moto3 all them years ago. But what a great guy. Just You just want him to do well. And we, we, we've said it, we keep saying it, this guy, his riding style, the way he's not phased, the way he's aggressive, that self-belief and confidence, he's a chance to go all the way. He really has. And I'm not just saying that you know, for effect. He's a chance. Once he figures out the puzzle how to ride a MotoGP bike, He'll be there for lots of years and he's a chance to win races, absolutely. And, and you know, coming from South Africa, I, I'm, I'm trying to put it into a kind of uh, context of, yeah, Britain has a, a fantastic motorcycle history and I'm not saying there isn't the motorcycle history there in South Africa. I mentioned Cork Ballington, but 
it's not on your doorstep, is it, to go to Europe? It's not right round the corner where you can, oh, yeah, we'll just pop over there and go to do this race, so on and so forth. You've, you've got to up sticks you've and, got and to, move to yeah. another continent. Look at, the, look at the riders that have been successful from countries like Australia or yeah. South Africa. You've got, you know, your Casey Stoners, your Jack Millers, obviously your Brad Binders. As a, British, as a young British rider, we hear this a lot, Gav, don't we? Riders going, yeah. oh, it's so, so bloody hard for the Brits. You know, no one will give us a chance. It's really difficult. My God, try doing it that their way. They literally have to sell everything, go and move their life, you know, halfway around the world and have a go at setting up and, and, and competing. The money, the obviously, you, you've, you're changing everything. It's so difficult for those riders. And that's what... You asked Brad that question... And actually, did he, he answered it in a really funny way. He basically went, it, it's almost too much to explain. Like, you could do a whole podcast on how Just Brad on Binder that, yeah. ended up in MotoGP. It's such a long answer. And he skirted around it really quickly, didn't he? Like, basically, yeah. No, that... but, but, but I do remember his, his, him, them rocking up, him and his mum, that year when they were doing uh, Rookies. And I remember speaking to them at the time. And it's like, well, oh, Dad's back home. Because we've got another brother who's also... Uh, wanting to ride or whatever, but he's still at home because, uh, and and it was a, a, apart from each other and the sacrifices. You're absolutely right that that uh, yeah. some of these families have had to make just yeah. to get there. And you're 12 years old. Like my son now is 11 years old. I can't, I can't actually. He's, he's 12 in in a week's time. So I can't imagine saying to my lad, right, we're off to Australia, me and you, and you can leave your mum and your sister back at home. Well. It'd be, in, it'd be in tears straight away. But like, well, no, I don't want to leave me mum. I don't, I don't want to be with you, Dad. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you can't yeah, blame me for that. I think that's more of a personal reflection on you. But, yeah, no, exactly. but, but, but yeah, the people we've known, seen do that in the past, whether it be Casey come over uh, as a youngster or Jack coming over to Germany, Casey came over to, to the UK. Uh, yeah, imagine and... being Jack going to Germany as well. Oh, what? No thanks. You know what I mean? Nothing against Germans, by the way. You know, I'm not being no, no, it's not but, a racist but it's comment. A, but no, but it's a different what, culture. You don't that's speak your language. Different language. Jack didn't speak German. You know what I mean? Imagine going I mean, there. He hardly and... speaks English. Well, fair point. <laughs> but how difficult that would be. It's horrendous. So yeah. The moral of this story is if you want to make it in in any sport, but if you want to make it in, in you know in, in motorcycle racing, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be tough. And it's going to be sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. And do you know what the whole bit is, Gav? When you get there and you look at Brad, he's got there. But, but now the work starts. Imagine what he's achieved in his career. He's had an incredible, incredible career. He's 24 years old and now the work begins. It's tough, but, yeah, it? And that's it. It's just, it's just at the start, really. He's a world champion, but he's still at the start of wanting to make it. Because, and I wonder, and this is my question, and I want, I want people to give us their opinion on this, really, because... Uh, in Britain, there's a comfort blanket of British Superbikes, which is a fantastic, brilliant championship. You've won it. You've been there. Um, but you can have a career. You can have a life and a career riding in that championship. Whereas as a, as a South African, and you've got a mate who's still riding at what? What age are you? 52. Riding at, uh, in, the, in the South African Superbike Championship. No, but it's not, you know, it's not a career as such, is it? it you know, you'll have, have to have another a life Job. outside of that. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You have to, where, whereas... I'm not saying, look, don't get me wrong, I know most British superbike riders um, are, are not m making money out of this. Uh, but my point no, being is No, a lot are, though. A lot are. They, you know, they, there'll be 15 riders in BSB who will earn a salary, and that's great, But does great, that make sense it? about the comfort blanket that I'm saying, whereas, whereas for, for someone like uh, the Australians who, yeah, they'll have an Australian superbike and maybe there's a couple being paid to ride, but, you know, not, not that many... Um, if you want to make a career out of this, you're going to have to give up everything to be in Grand Prix racing. Whereas from from the UK, I think there's this. Oh uh, well, there's you know we can go to Grand Prix or we can go to World Superbike or we can go to British Superbike or do you know what I'll do all right in in Superstock or Super Sport or that sort of thing. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, hundred percent. That's it. But also, what I, you you've got to back it up. What we're talking about, we've named riders that have made the ultimate sacrifice and made it. There are also oh, hundred, yeah. hundreds of families over the years I, I, sold up everything, remortgaged everything, you know, gone to try and achieve the ultimate and you know uh, create a career for their son or daughter, and it's but it's not worked out, and they've you know you come home and you've nothing and you have to rebuild your life. So 
there is that side of it as well. So of course, one hundred percent. And I wouldn't want to forget those people as well because we are talking one person in the country of however many million in South Africa. We're talking, you know, one Jack Miller, and before that Casey Stoner, and before that, what well, you know, Gary McCoy, for example. You know, we're yeah. talking one person in each generation generally yeah. coming through and and making it because because of how difficult it is, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it is difficult. It's difficult. Well, anyway, I'm I'm so glad that he's made it. I'm so glad we got to speak to him, um, Brad Binder, and I cannot wait for him to get started in MotoGP. Um, I, a little question which I didn't get to touch on because he can't say anything about KTM. We know what we can ask him about and what he's going to talk to us about. Is the KTM the right bike for him to be on at this time, Neil? Well, the answer to that is no. If you was going to choose for a rookie, what back, what motorcycle would you choose? You'd, you'd, you'd want him on a Yamaha. That's what we've Yamaha, seen yeah. over the years. That said, KTM, and we, we've, we've said it before when we were you know, working with BT, KTM is a, is a manufacturer that when they go racing, they go racing to win. It's a relatively small manufacturer compared to some of the bigger Japanese ones. But as far as race department, KTM is all about racing and all about winning. And when you look at the classes that they've gone into in the past. They've dominated the off-road world championships, all, all forms of it. Then they started, started road racing. They dominated it to, um, 125cc, Moto3, Moto2, and then they've made the big step, what is it now, five years ago into MotoGP, four years ago. And they, they're still on the massive hey. up, 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 upward curve. And Br- Brad will be... Is, it's, it's actually, timing-wise, it's probably worked out really good for Brad because the bike's getting there. It's not 100% sorted, but what he can do now with his skill and talent is um, help them develop a bike that will suit him around him and get the most out of it. So, actually, I think the KTM will suit him. But I also think there's a thing with KTM in terms of expectations. We talk about it a lot, uh, about riders exceeding expectations and the paddock has a knowledge of when somebody's um, exceeding expectations and that's all anyone really ever asks isn't it of um, of a rider is to go beyond what's expected of them and on the KTM your expectations are instantly low aren't they yeah yeah you saw right and actually just think about how Brad has gone on with his pre-season testing like he said at the first test it was pretty much last but only a couple of seconds off the pace and then every other test he's chipped away at it and chipped away at it and on the final day of the final test was he about eighth fastest? It, yeah, he it, was it, in the top ten, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah something yeah. like that. And, and and that just underlines what you've just said. What he's done then, he, he's, he's, he's overperformed, hasn't he? He's, he's gone better than everybody expected. And what that does then is it puts you on everybody's radar. Let's not forget yeah, because, co- contract time up, and all that. Exactly. Lot. Well, contract time's going to come much sooner than than uh, a lot of people had hoped. You know, and I mean that for Valentino Rossi as well, who was hoping to have a few races to decide what he was going to do. It's going to be interesting to see what happens there in his future. But, yeah. I, you know, and I know, I'm sure Brad will, you know, stay on for another year, but contracts are all coming up at the end of this uh, season, non-season. Uh, but I, I just think if you could have easily jumped on a Yamaha and it not quite worked for you. And then people think, well, Yamaha's the bike to be on, you know. I've seen it happen to people who jumped on a Honda or jumped on a Ducati and everyone goes, well, he's on a Honda, it's like on a Ducati. When, it, when the bikes weren't that great, but the, the expectations are higher, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And on a KTM, yeah. they're lower. That, that's true, that's true. Yeah, you've got that, you have got the comfort blanket of the expectation being slightly lower. And because of what Brad's achieved previously, everybody will cut him some slack. He's got credit in the bank. Exactly. That's a good way of putting it. He's got credit in the bank. We all know how talented he is. So if he has a a, a tough first half of the season, he he still won't be... No one will be going, this guy's shit. Everybody will be going, no, don't worry. Brad, because he's a bright lad, he'll figure this out. A little bit like Miguel Oliveira. You know, Oliveira, who was a rookie last year... Mm. figured it out he, he had some injury issues so that which which set him back I, but, I, I rate both of them highly me too you know I, you know me and, and Miguel Oliveira are a massive fan and, yeah. and always think he's been given the short end of the straw hey we'll have to get him on he'll be perfect he speaks perfect English as well I mean, and he's he's got some stories blimey yeah yeah we'll we'll have a we'll have a launch for uh, Miguel yeah uh, in the future but uh, let's say goodbye to everyone we've uh, taken up far too much of people's time um, and uh, hopefully we'll be 
back with you very soon indeed. Um, your Easter weekend, Neil, we're back on air on Sunday. Um, I'm going to be speaking to Cal Crutchlow uh, and I'm speaking hopefully to Danny Pedrosa too. Oh, that'll be good. Big Danny, yeah. see what he's got to so, say. O- got... Always like to have a chat with Danny, Mr Charisma. I, we, I'll be, we, I mean, we... <laughs> I can't wait. But we've got his win in Bruno 2012, the head-to-head with Jorge Lorenzo. That was uh, a great we've race. Got, we've got Cal's win in Argentina. Oh, what, t- 2018? 2018. Oh, cracker. Uh, where, well, obviously, the Mark and Valentino clash and Jack starting 50 yards up the road. So I, quite, can't, I want to see how people react to that one. Uh, we've also got Casey beating Valentino in Barcelona 2007. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. So is, that's this Sunday we're doing that, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. BT and then we've also one. got Istanbul 2006. But yeah. Do you remember that one? No. I can't wait for it because Istanbul was such an amazing track. And it was Melandri versus Stoner. Right. And uh, I remember it had that fast corner. It's got like the scariest it's corner. It's got like ever. an eau rouge. It's a fast right hander up yeah. and over, yeah. Up and over, yeah, know, that's the one. There was one, was it a collision between Hector Barber and Alex De Angelis? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a that's a Google that, everybody. That's a proper collision, isn't it? That was lucky. That was one of those that was lucky coming down the straight there, uh, coming out of that corner. But yeah, so we've got those coming up um, this weekend. I think we're going to try and speak to Marco Melandri as well. So that'd be fun anyway. Yeah. Um, cool. Are you having a braai? Yeah, I'll be having a braai. Yeah, I'm always, <laughs> I've always got my braais out. Yeah, get having Put a braai. Put them away. Put them away. Throw another shrimp on the braai. Yeah. <laughs> What are you doing, Gav? Uh, I am literally going to be working all weekend uh, now with um, interviews and prepping for Sunday. So that'll be uh, fun. Yeah. You what? You, you, you actually prep? Some work does go into this. You, you Some prep. Work. Keep up. Like the prepping basically is vacuuming. All oh, right. right. <laughs> I'm rearranging the books on my bookshelf. Right, good uh, stuff. You're starting to bore me now, Gav. I'm going to have to go and eat yeah, a brew. And everyone else at home. Right, right. speak to you later on and uh, see everyone soon. Hang Thanks on, for hang all on. your input. I love you, man. Oh, he never says it back. Out. Have you noticed, everyone? This is starting to be a thing. It creeps me out. Yeah. Creeps well, me I out. do. Anyway, I do. Uh, I'm not in some American film. Well, um, I love and... you, man. All right. <laughs> uh, Bye. Give Kate, give Kate a kiss from me. <laughs> I mean, that's even creepier. <laughs> oh, I, hope you've got a, I hope you've got a top on while you're doing this today. <laughs> <laughs> it's all I can say. Um, all right. right. And um, see you all later. To Winnie. Will do. See you later. Bye-bye. See you, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Add, add BB. Oh, I do like his number this year as well. Actually, now. Oh, I love that number. That's gonna. That's gonna be iconic, isn't it? It is. It is though, isn't it? That's gonna stick with him for the rest of his career. Oh, he's unavailable. Come on, Brad Binder, oh, unavailable. <laughs> it's happening again. Oh God. How do I go back to the other screen? <laughs> God. Is this gonna be where we end up with the outtakes at the end? Give you a ring when ready. Give me a ring when ready. And he said that four minutes ago, uh, ten minutes ago. So, um, right. I'm just try again. I'll just try and add him again. It's just seamless, though, isn't it, Gav? I mean, this We've is just got... this is what people uh, pay the big bucks for, isn't it? Yeah, pay, pay. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you? Did, what's he doing? This is why people don't pay anything. For this kind of tech, yeah. <laughs> <No else. laughs> utter shite. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll have to send him a message again. Yeah. Always great, thanks, bud. That was his message. Always great, thanks, bud. Um, trying to call now. You online. It's funny when I messaged him yesterday, he came back and he put. How is it, bud? bud. Yeah. And, and it's how, then with a capital Z, I-T, how is it, bud? It's so, it's so him, isn't it? Yeah. With his strong South African accent. Is that I love or, it. Or bro. Bro. Yeah. Oh, he's active now. I'll give him another go. He's active. He's active. Let's go back. And there we go. I'm recording this conversation. Start recording. 
Art. Brad. Art. Brad. Art. Brad. Come on, Brad. One, two, three, four, five. How are we going? How is it working? Calling Brad Binder. I can hear you, Gav. That's good. The main thing is um, we can hear can each hear other. You. And we just would like to hear Mr. Binder down the other end. Can you do a South African accent? I ah, tried to call. Oh, no, it was me. I wrote that. <laughs> Hello. Oh, here he is. Here he is. Hey, how's it going? Sorry, man. <laughs> do, do not worry about it. I mean, we honestly, we've had bigger farces. So, uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where where people are, sound like they're done a hell. We can actually hear you. Uh, is it? Can you hear me? Well, that's good news. Yeah. Whereabouts are you at the moment, Brad? I'm actually just chilling in, at home in South Africa.